So we are going to do a quick little talk about uh, the realities of fires as we've experienced them. Um, and our little talk is called Life Happens on the Journey to Fi. So before we begin, just a little bit about us. Um, as he mentioned, I'm Kirsten, also known as Mrs. R&R. This is my husband, Julian, Mr. R&R. And together we have a beautiful baby boy who is almost two named Bo, who we affectionately call baby R&R. Um, <laughs> Our love story is kind of interesting. We met at work, <laughs> so we're not some of those people that just like hate work because we actually met each other there. Um, we got engaged in Machu Picchu, Peru, and then got married in New Orleans in 2015 and honeymooned in South Africa, which was a life-changing trip for us. That's when we really decided that fire was the lifestyle for us. Um, that's Bo on his first birthday, and uh, we live in Atlanta, Georgia, right outside of Atlanta in a suburb called Smyrna. Cool. A little bit more about us. Um, our estimated FI date is June 2021. Uh, like many of you, we are passive income, uh, passive index fund investors. We like to keep it simple. Uh, don't really want to think that much more about it. However, we are very intrigued by options and trading, so hopefully we'll I'll get into that in a couple years. Uh, we own two rental properties. One we own uh, completely debt free. The other we have a small mortgage on. Uh, we're also entrepreneurs. And so we started this blog as a passion project. It is now a full fledged uh, business. And we are in the beginning stages of rolling out that business plan now. Uh, we are lovers of, of food, wine, travel, wine, <laughs> business, uh, and, and the arts. And from time to time, we like to drink wine. Um, <laughs> While doing business. While doing business <laughs> and traveling. Um, four reasons why we are pursuing financial independence. The first one uh, is to break the generational cycle of poverty and financial illiteracy. Uh, we experience this in our family lives on all levels. Uh, Kirsten can talk about her parents. Yeah, my parents, um, my mother is one of nine and my dad is one of three but has an interesting um, upbringing where he was raised by his aunts and uncles. Um, my parents uh, both went to college. They both made six figures and they were the first to do so in their family without using their hands. So they worked corporate jobs. Um, we grew up middle class, always had a house. We weren't quite the Huxtables, but <laughs> it was definitely like Laura Winslow, you know, Steve Urkel kind of house. Um, <laughs> But just a very, a very solid um, upbringing that was very different from the way that they were raised. Yeah, there is no sitcom for uh, my show. My <laughs> um, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and if anything, it's more like old school law and order. So, um, that's, that's where I was raised. Uh, it is what you call a broken family, but obviously we're still a family. Um, my mother is what you would consider financially insecure, and she accepts that now, and we're in the process of trying to roll out how we're going to support her as a part of our journey. On the other side, we've got my father, who 30 years ago bought a plot of land down in Northport, Florida for pennies, and a couple years ago built his retirement home, and he's living his best life. And so, again, our experience is all over the board, um, but... Ultimately, it's still kind of broken. There are varying degrees of financial illiteracy throughout our family, uh, and so we want to break that. Uh, the second one, we are very clear about this, and it is to inspire the African-American community and other minority groups to take greater control of their lives despite the challenges. We're going to talk a little bit about those challenges, um, but that is something that is core to who we are. It is a part of our experience uh, and something that we want to help share uh, with as many people as possible. Um, number three was to escape the rat race and live a more fulfilling life. I think for women, uh, there's a prevailing narrative of like lean in and the only future that you can look for either involves a man or a baby. And I really just wanted to disrupt that when I looked at all the women who were leaning in and claiming that they had it all. I just didn't feel like they were being genuine. And so fire was my relief from that. I felt like I had another option to just opt out altogether instead of, you know, constantly climbing a ladder. And then last but not least, this is a really important for one, uh, one for us, is to change the popular image of black wealth that's portrayed in the media. In our community, it's often, you know, wealth is often attached to hypervisibility or fame. And so the examples that are used are the Oprahs and the Obamas. And it just, you know, that level of exceptionalism makes it really hard to empathize with the everyday experience of a black American. They are the exception to the rule. They are not, <laughs> they are not the norm. 
And um, we really just wanted to be regular people, you know, the millionaires next door that are also black and can talk open and honestly about our experience. And here's why. Um, it's because the racial wealth gap is growing. So when you look at the differences between the net worth of black families and white families, white families have nearly 10x the net worth of black families. And so when you look even closer at the one percenters, uh, the one percenters of white families have an average net worth of about $12 million versus the one percenters of black families, which is about one and a half million dollars, which is ironically our fire number. So when we go fire, we will not only be free from work, we will also be in the top 1% of our community, which makes it a very lonely journey and something that we want to invite more people to because you don't want to seem like you're at the top of any sort of social pyramid because it makes it a little awkward given our family situation where we've got people across you know, all spectrums of wealth um, you know, to make sure that we can still be approachable and normal and regular. Yeah. Um, so we want a couple more points around how this kind of comes to life. You think about anybody here from Boston. All right. You're probably familiar with this stat. This is not an attack on Boston. But just to be clear, uh, there was an article by the Boston Globe that came out in 2017. And it spoke about the median, black, uh, the median net worth of black Bostonians. Uh, and this is horrifying, but does anybody want to guess what that number is? I've seen the article. You've seen the article. So you're not <laughs> There's no prize. <laughs> Let's be clear. Does anybody else? <laughs> I'm gonna guess it's in the negative. It's it's that there is there's no positive net worth. It is positive. It is running fast in that direction, but the number is eight dollars. <gasps> the, the median net worth of black Bostonians is eight dollars. I am so glad that you guys are shocked by that number. Um, because that means that we introduce something to you. <laughs> One of the words that we use regularly and we want to use more often is the word crisis. Uh -huh. I don't know how bad this has to get or how fast to negative we need to go in order for things to be considered a crisis. For some reason, when you get that lucky label, things start to happen, right? And so uh, we hope that we can earn the right to call this a crisis so that we can start thinking creatively and start putting plans into action. Um, but let's think about what this looks like for us, right? And so we paid off the mortgage on our home uh, on Kirsten's birthday, September 7, 2017. It was not planned that way. Uh, well, well, right around the last month, we were like, you know, we could actually do it. Let's just hold off <laughs> on sending that last payment and let's go on your birthday and that will be awesome. And that's exactly what we did. We walked into Wells Fargo uh, and we, set out that wire transfer and uh, we paid off our mortgage. That home then became one of our rentals uh, and things have been great so far. The moment we did that, we wanted to dig into the census to see where that put us um, and to put that in perspective. For African Americans under the age of 40, that put us in the 0.001%, right? And so we're not just unicorns, we're literal like black unicorns. <laughs> So you like really like you can go unicorn hunting if you want to. No, don't. You will likely never see the black. <laughs> um, so why does this matter? Um, one, you know, if you are, are curious enough and you have a global perspective and you've seen what happens or what has happened to countries in Europe, you've seen uh, Africa and the Middle East, you've seen what inequality can lead to. Uh, we believe that we really shouldn't be fooling ourselves to think that those sorts of things can't happen here. We are really divided as is right now. And this is not to make anyone uncomfortable or to lead into some sort of deep political discussion. But it's safe to say that the seeds for division and instability are already here. And we think that inequality is a part of that. And so that's one of the reasons why we think uh, this is important. I know I said I wouldn't get into a political discussion, but I will say <laughs> um, we also believe that countries, uh, our country and its leaders, we have an opportunity, and particularly those that are elected officials, uh, they have an obligation to make sure that the playing field is level for everyone, and that is something that is core uh, to our message. And this last one is really just my two cents and soapbox in that we tend to use the word movement a little liberally. And when you think about movements like the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, disability rights movements, they're all trying to move society towards a form of justice. 
And so for in order for fire to really be a, a true movement, we all have to wrap our heads around economic injustices and start to use our our power, our leverage, our freedom, our spare time, our energy to to right some of the wrongs from our past. Based on some email chatter that we've been a part of, uh, I think Vicky Robbins is the other one who believes. Really yeah, it's just me and Vicky. About that. <laughs> <laughs> this is Vicky. Uh, and everyone else is kind of like, I mean, okay, keep scrolling if you want to. Um, but that is something that's important to us. So uh, the next, there was a slide in between this that got really deep and was like, you know what, <laughs> we're just going to skip that one. Um, so how can you help, right? Uh, everyday people, um, how can you help with your hearts? Empathize, listen, learn. If you have the opportunity to, sit down, have a conversation. Do not make assumptions about your coworkers, about the people, the, the, your service providers. Don't do that, right? Listen, empathize, and if you have an opportunity, sit down and have a real conversation with them. Um, but the other thing, I think particularly for those of us in the room that have properties, that have substantial portfolios, that have and own businesses, teach, right? If you, and especially, you probably know or have a plumber or, or someone that you work with that is not like you, that doesn't have that experience. Take a second after you sign that check or you know, pay that invoice, ask them how their family's doing, and you'd be surprised. They may say something like, my son is going to school because he wants to be a real estate investor. And that's when you can come in and introduce them to bigger pockets because likely they've never heard of it. Mm -hmm. it and, and they don't have anyone that's going to do that. Or maybe you went to one of the five conferences that you've gone to and you got a bunch of free stuff, a mad scientist t-shirt. Donate that book. Oh, donate that t-shirt, right? Um, and see what that can do. And I'm telling you right now, that book can change somebody's life and it costs you absolutely nothing. All the swag that you get at a conference, right? That we do the same thing. We give it to Goodwill because we don't need another t-shirt or we don't need another notebook, right? Give those things away and use it to help broker a conversation with someone that otherwise may not be exposed to the sort of things that you know and are accustomed to on a regular basis. And this last one is to stay woke. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this phrase, but it's a slang term for a level of consciousness and mindfulness. It's about being awake, looking at society with a fresh pair of eyes. We are all effectively woke about our portfolios. We know when a property is below the 1% rule. We know when the market has dipped. We know when it's a good deal, when it's a bad deal. And all we're asking is to use that same lens, that same level of consciousness when we're, we're talking about something like race. Um, if you are, uh, if you have the opportunity to support a black business, do that. Statistically, black businesses have less, less access to capital than their white counterparts. And so your revenue is meaningful in a different way. If you have an opportunity to support a diversity initiative at your office or in your own business, do that. If you have an opportunity to speak on a panel or you're throwing an event, make sure that the audience is representative of you know what America actually looks like. And yes, that means you may need to take an extra step to do that, but it's really important to make sure that a lot of different voices are at the table so it doesn't become just an echo chamber. All right, plot twist. It's not actually what we're here to talk about. <laughs> so, <laughs> we wanted to do the deep dive on that because again, it's important that we not just tell you our story from a money perspective, but we wanted to make sure that you know what that money story is like in the context of being a black American. And so those stats kind of ground this part, which I'm sure you can relate to, which is how life happens on the journey to FI. These are a little more, you know, kind of universal. Um, so now we'll, we'll actually start our talk. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we started our journey in 2014. We met in 2012. So in 2014, that was the year we got engaged. Um, and our plan was really just to eliminate remaining debt. So that was our primary mortgage and paying off our rental property. We also wanted to get married debt free. We wanted to live small and renovate our existing home because we knew we'd flip it to a second rental. We wanted to invest, splurge on a honeymoon, and then from there, see what happens. So we had this grand plan in 2014. What we thought would happen, um, we thought that we would talk about money. <laughs> And it would just, you know, we'd be like, uh, we would attract like-minded people. Our close friends and family all of a sudden would have this awakening and they would say, wow, I'm glad somebody is finally talking about this. Um, and that was not the case. Uh, we also thought, because we'd seen and we're pretty well versed in the blogosphere with respect to personal finance, that we would get a lot of hate mail and we would be bombarded by internet trolls and people who have absolutely nothing to else to do with their lives than be mean uh, on the internet. Um, we did 
didn't experience that either. Uh, we thought people would get attacked by calling ourselves rich. Uh, we are. In fact, everyone here is likely rich compared to what the average salary is and certainly compared to other countries. So let's be honest about that. Um, but we didn't get any of that. What we actually encountered was uh, friends and family who were mostly <laughs> like, you know, we believe it when we see it, right? They were big fans of us. They loved us. They love what we're doing. They love that we are having the courage. But this whole fire thing, like, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, old friends faded away and new friends appeared. And so um, I, I'm really uh, excited about even the conversation I had with Brad this morning. We were talking about, uh, we weren't talking about masculinity, but we were talking mm -hmm. about manhood. And I think that was at the root of some of, uh, and I'll just be honest, some of my relationships falling apart because... Um, I had some friends who I believe have very strong beliefs about money and the role that it plays in their lives. And so to be honest and to be transparent is to be honest about their failures, which they tie directly to their role as men. And as a result, being around someone who's likely doing well is very uncomfortable. And as a result, they kind of faded to black. That's my belief. I've had a couple of conversations with some of those people who have essentially validated that. Um, but that's what happened. From a work perspective, um, for those that don't know our story, Julie and I actually worked for the same company. And so when we launched our blog, we launched and we weren't anonymous and we were really surprised by how supportive our coworkers were. Um, because here we were talking about, oh, work is just limited and not supportive. And they were like, yeah, <laughs> and we all work at the same place, <laughs> which was really interesting. Uh, strangers were also really supportive, which was a nice, uh, you know, opposite of what we experienced with our friends and family. Um, I'm still employed there. Julian left in June and I'm actually more productive at work. I thought I, you know, I would become apathetic once I decided I'm going to retire, but I'm actually more productive. I made the most money I've ever made at work last year. I got promoted because I've applied those same fire principles to my job. I really focus on the work that provides the most value, everything else be damned. And what it led to is I have a lower tolerance for BS and work politics, but the stuff that matters, the stuff that actually moved the needle, I excel at. Uh, we experienced parents who just don't get it, right? And so we talked about some of our parents that were all across the board in other areas, but with respect to uh, uh, our journey, uh, you know, they essentially were a part of, or in some cases, wrote this old school playbook that told you to go to school, buy the big house, and do those things. And so the fact that we are zagging when they expected us to zig is a bit <laughs> off-putting. Um, we also, as I mentioned, uh, experienced financial in insecurities, right? We've been chipping away at this for years, and when we finally got to the heart of it, we realized that my mother's tank was on E. But if you'd let her tell it, she thought she was at, she had a quarter tank left. We've got time, we'll figure it out. <laughs> She didn't. And so I was really glad it took us some time to get there, but we're there now uh, and we're working towards it. Um, we experienced astonishing levels of financial uh, illiteracy. And this is not just in people who are uh, uneducated or miseducated. I can, I'm not going to say their names, obviously, but there are people who are managing multi million dollar. Uh, brands and campaigns or, or businesses and budgets that can't seem to apply that same level of uh, acumen to their personal lives, right? And so this is a very real thing for us, uh, and, and it's definitely, you know, it was unexpected, uh, but we did experience that. Yeah. The other unexpected part was the loneliness and the isolation and thought. We're not in the 1% right now. We're still people that got, you know, toddlers and <laughs> mortgages and things like that, but the way that we think about money, the way that we think about our life, the way that we think about our time, we couldn't necessarily relate to our friends in the same way who were used to us talking about haircuts and bird box and whatever movie was out recently that we, we didn't partake in. Um, also, you know, just when you start to make decisions about your life, depending on your entry point to fire, you may or may not have to be more extreme on the upfront. Or there might be periods where you're really doubling down on savings and just our, the understanding and the empathy that we thought we would get from our friends just wasn't there. It was a very, it, it, there, were, there were times that were very lonely or isolating, which led to the next one, uh, the impact on our relationship. There's been a lot of good. We've saved a lot of money. We got a lot of wins and we're in a good place financially. But the energy that comes from the loneliness and the isolation, there's not really anywhere to 
put it. <laughs> and so sometimes there were points where, you know, we would resent each other or I would resent Julian because it was him that brought me on the journey. And so there were times where I felt like I had been dragged into this lifestyle where the win isn't early or easy and I just didn't have the tools to communicate it. I didn't know how to communicate. I didn't have the same outlets in my friends groups. I couldn't go on the girl trip because we needed to max out the IRA. <laughs> so it just... <laughs> We, we had to work through those things and, and really quantify what's a real loss versus like an imagined one. All right. So why does this matter? Um, our perspective. If you're good at managing money, you're probably always going to be good at managing money, right? Like that skill set doesn't really go away. Um, MK spoke about this this morning to a degree, but focus on the other things, right? Those skills don't go away, um, which leads us to the second bullet. Financially savvy people have a tendency to believe that they can do anything, right? I mean, I, especially if you're self-made, right? And, and naturally, you've done some amazing things. Um, but a lot of that stuff does not translate to relationships. And so you really have to be, we're not relationship experts, right? I'm just telling you, this is what we experienced. And so if you're in this situation, uh, I know there were a couple people saying, hey, you know, the partner's kind of on board or not. We're just being transparent here, you know? Focus on those things. Don't ignore those signs. Um, Third, consider what would happen if you achieved phi earlier than you thought. Um, for those of us who've been in the market for the, a while, you know, during this amazing boom, um, there's no way that you can really predict or that you could have predicted that. We all know that, yes, this works in cycles, but um, we're prepared that for this next boom, right, we're all going to see an incredible return, right? And so if you happen to hit your number sooner rather than later, what are you going to do about that? Um, are you really, really prepared for that? Do you have a plan uh, for where you're going to go, what you're going to do, how you're going to spend your time? Uh, and then lastly, who do you want by your side along the way? Not just your partner, but your friends, those old friends. Are you mentally and emotionally prepared to, uh, to discard some people? Are you mentally, or to be discarded? Uh, are you really prepared to reintroduce yourself to new people. It's one thing to be here. It's another thing to really build lifelong relationships um, that can help support you along the way. So here's a couple of suggestions. We haven't done all of these things, but we feel like they're great ideas. So we wanted to share them. Um, <laughs> the first one MK covered this morning, which is um, drafting that personal family vision statement. Because as you're going through the sludge of tactics and the years of savings, you need that North Star that reminds you why. It doesn't have to be solid. It could be a why for the next three weeks. It can be a why for the next month. It can be a why for the next year. But you really need something that kind of centers you and grounds you into why you're doing what you're doing. The second one is to co conduct regular reviews of your non-financial goals. So like we have a vacation goal that we're both really bummed that we missed <laughs> last week, uh, last year. And we actually which distinguished, was last week. which was last week. You're right. You're not wrong. Yeah, I'm not wrong. Um, <laughs> we, we have a vacation goal that we set every year. And we, we actually go as far as to differentiate the difference between a trip, travel and vacation. And vacation is supposed to be like restorative. It usually means my son is not there. Like it's just <laughs> us focusing on us, no other responsibilities. And we didn't hit that goal. Um, the other thing I would advise is to seek feedback from those who know you best. They're the ones who can tell if you're, be if you're drawing back or you're a little off or you're apathetic or you're a little judgy and they can kind of keep you in check along your journey. And then the third one is really to plan for fire burnout and to take breaks. So this one was um, important for us because we started noticing a pattern that our spending and savings rate in November and December were very different than the rest of the year. Because November and December is when we tend to splurge, we're with family, we eat out, we spoil our nieces, we do all sorts of things that we wouldn't normally do during uh, the year. And we used to beat ourselves up about it, but we realized that it's just a form of burnout. Like you just want to veg out and that should be totally fine, and, you know, obviously within reason. Um, but it's okay to take breaks. It's okay to look at a year as 10 months long instead of 12 months long and you squeeze, you know, you, you upload up front. Uh, another one, seek several communities, right? The fire community is one, uh, but you can be a writer. You can be all sorts of things. You can be a pole dancer. There are tons <laughs> of communities. There the are pole, pole dancing community? 
<laughs> where is this community? I'm, 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 I'm actually curious. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> but I'm curious. I'm like, what made me jump to pole dance? Um, In a church. Here we are. My apologies. Uh, fight the tendency to, uh, to judge old friends and families. And, and my personal favorites, schedule your celebrations uh, and switch it up. We are big fans of food and wine, as we said, but even we get sick of cooking at home, right, or even going out to eat. Sometimes you really just need to be completely out of your comfort zone. Do that thing that you get out of the Google, Facebook world that is only reintroducing you to the things that you have already searched for or you thought that you thought of. You didn't. It was served up to you. Leave those world, go incognito, and find things that you would likely have not found uh, otherwise, and then use that as part of a celebration. Because just breaking through and, and, and doing something that you likely have never done before can oftentimes be one of the most joyful uh, things you've ever done. Um, so that's our talk. Questions?